So what you see here as the title of this webinar is, But What If My Resume? And it's going to be talking about strategizing specific situations in job search writing. I'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a moment, but we'll begin with a little bit about me, and that's the, I'm your host for the afternoon. Uh, the biggest thing that you might know since you came to this from the Plural site is that I'm actually an author of one of the resume courses that Plural site offers through the libraries, specifically resumes research and writing on the job hunt. That course has been live for about six months, and it's uh, going to talk a lot about some of the things that we reference here um, in a lot more detail than the webinar format supports. Um, other things about me, I teach at DePaul University. My specialty there is technical and professional writing. I teach a lot of their technical writing courses as well as things that aren't quite so you know, technical specific but have more of a business writing generalist emphasis. The next thing is that I've been teaching and editing resumes for over 15 years. That's in a variety of contexts. One of my first jobs after college actually was working for a relocation service where people who had been transferred from one job to another and had spouses that then needed new jobs, we would work with them and talk about their needs and objectives, and it was our job to then calibrate a resume to their circumstances. So in that job, I wrote about 10 resumes a day, and that was a job that I had for quite a while, you know, right before after I finished up undergraduate. And other than that, it's been working with resumes on an independent consulting basis, as well as about 50 resumes coming through a classroom environment per term. So I got a lot of uh, experience with this. So the next thing to do is I'd like to know a little bit about who you are. Um, so I'm going to stop actually sharing my screen real quick, and Lindsay is going to start a couple of quick polls so that we can know a little bit about the demographics of people who are attending the webinar at the moment and then I'll know how to calibrate kind of the way that I talk to you guys appropriately. So we are stopping the screen sharing broadcast, and Lindsay is going to be coming through and uh, starting up the poll. The first poll, as you can see coming up, is about which of the following describes your present job situation. You know, A, looking for my first job, B, employed but looking for better, C, recently unemployed and still searching, or D, unemployed for two months or more. Um, we've got responses already starting to come in. Employee but looking for something better seems to have the clear commanding lead right now with 17. Or a vast majority of people seem to be in that circumstance. Um, a little bit more coming in from looking for my first job, unemployed for two months. We've got 32 responses in from this one, and out of 51 people currently in the webinar. And I see now display results to participants. Okay, well, what I see here um, is actually you're in a, in a pretty good circumstance. One of the easiest ways to develop a resume is if you're in a, a situation where you actually have a job currently and you're you know, just trying to branch out into your next opportunity. All right, so that's, we're going to close out that poll right now. And then uh, if we would start up, Lindsay, with the second poll. Oh, you can see there. Uh, which of the following best describes your attitude towards your current resume? Um, it reflects skills for the target job. It has the basics, but that's it. You're not sure what employers really want, or you currently don't have a resume. I see somebody who's made a comment here. The uh, lean towards employed people from the previous poll is probably because current employers subscribe to Pluralsight for us, which is ironic, really. <laughs> I hadn't quite thought of that in terms of the demographic that we're, we're pulling from here. But there's, uh, if you've got a corporate Pluralsight account, I can, I can see some likelihood for that. Uh, so things are starting to come in here. Uh, we're about split evenly here from the first three options. Uh, looks like we've already gotten 33 people. I'm going to say that's representative. So Lindsay, if you would display the results here. And there we are. As you can see, we've got almost a perfect thirds breakdown. You feel like it reflects the skills for the target job. It's got the basics, but that's it. Or you're not quite sure what employers really want. Um, and that's 
uh, actually about what I would have expected. And it also means that you're probably in the right spot here, um, especially if you're in the not sure what employers really want or has the basics, but that's it. So I'm going to go back and share my screen again, and we will go ahead and resume talking about the resume okay, course. So the first thing to talk about in terms of our actual course content is why we're setting this up as a webinar. Um, I was actually really excited about doing this webinar because I think there's a real gap in the current course offerings from Pluralsight. And it's not necessarily a gap that is, is a flaw. It's just a, kind of a limitation of the way Pluralsight courses are typically distributed. And that's namely that courses are targeted to groups and not necessarily to individuals. In large measure, I think that this is a practical limitation. When people log into Pluralsight, they're doing this video training. And that video training is actually, as you guys, most of you know, being broadcast globally. And we have, I think it's over 195 countries where Pluralsight is currently available. So that means that the same information by necessity and design has to be sent out to everybody. Now the limitation with something like resumes is that unlike some of the other courses that Pluralsight offers where they're more focused on kind of hard skill functional material, resumes are primarily calibrated towards individuals, not to large or not to large groups. So you can talk about kind of the uh, resume as a genre and all of the different kind of common circumstances or conventions that it might entail. But there's always going to be some people, even though it's broadcast out to everybody, who end up being kind of left out where kind of the general circumstances about resumes don't seem to 100% apply. And those people often end up asking, but what if my resume blank? People who have circumstances or situations that kind of fall outside the normal range of anticipated you know, formats that a resume is, is often going to occupy. So that means that this webinar is not going to be about general advice. It's going to be about specific situations. And the hope is that we're actually going to be able to leverage the webinar format here and take advantage of the interactivity between me as an instructor and as well as a host in this case, not a plural site instructor but between me and you as audience members where you're going to get an opportunity at the conclusion of this webinar to really ask questions about your individual circumstances so that we can kind of talk through them. So let's go through the agenda of what we're going to be doing in, in a little bit more detail. It breaks down into three parts. The first part is going to cover kind of ways of thinking about resumes. And this might be for the people who are in the first third where you kind of know the basics of a resume, but you know, don't necessarily know a lot of the nuances, and especially if you feel like you're unfamiliar with what resumes are going to be entailing. The next thing we're going to be doing is talking through four user-submitted questions. Before this webinar went live, when it was first in the planning stages, we sent things out to, to Twitter and to social media, kind of asking people what questions they had about their specific resumes. And we got quite a few that came in, and I picked four that I think are fairly representative of circumstances that I see a lot of people talking to me about finding trouble. And then what we're going to do is open this up for a discussion with all of you, where we're going to go out of screen sharing and back into chat so you can have a question about your own individual situations. And just so you know here, um, Lindsay is monitoring the chat right now. So if you've got a question about your own resume as we go through, feel free to type it up and send it in. And Lindsay is going to be collecting some of those so that once we get to that third part of the agenda, we'll have some situations just ready to go and ready to talk through. That's the one that I'm most excited about because I'm really looking forward to you know, hopefully digging in with some specific ones. The door image there uh, comes from my uh, background as a professor because I always have office hours and some of the most productive conversations are when my door is open and people come by and they say, here's the situation I am in. And that's what I want to talk about. Now one quick disclaimer, 
One thing we're not going to be doing in this webinar is looking at sample resumes. If a full-fledged sample resume is what you're after, a lot of the job search writing courses in the Pluralsight Library have them available and talk about the choices of those resumes in detail. This webinar is going to focus on strategy behind how to approach resumes, looking a bit about the process rather than the product. So that's why we're taking this approach. Let's start with ways of thinking about individual resumes. I've framed this conversation in a lot of different ways throughout courses, but one thing that hasn't existed yet within the Pluralsight Library is talking about where modern resumes come from. There's sometimes a perception when you're working with a kind of modern document that it just sort of appeared, but the resume actually has gone through a lot of different phases and shifts throughout its lineage. And the way people approach resumes sometimes has a little bit to do with when they first learned about them. And so to give you an idea of what I mean, we're going to start all the way back here in the 1890s, which is kind of the very beginning of the resumes as a format. Back then, there really was no resume. People would send letters when they were looking for jobs. And this was, uh, began because of uh, kind of literacy rates back in the time of the 1890s and the 1900s were now widespread enough, uh, particularly among business owners, that it would, people were able to have this kind of correspondence. And in those correspondence, there would be several bullet points about qualifications that were embedded within the letter itself. So what we think of as a cover letter and a resume was almost this like, perfect hybrid document. That changed a little bit in the 1920s when it became typical to include a biographical list of experiences on a separate page. In the 1920s, you've got a lot of industries that have kind of taken what we think of as modern business operations. And in the 1920s, one of the conventions was that a resume is strictly going to be a fact-based document with no packaging or spin. Now, all resumes, of course, are still going to have a sense of honesty, and, and a trait of honesty is one of their main focuses. But in the 1920s, it was almost like just a bullet point biography. You know, nothing in there about addressing an individual audience, for example. That was the standard for quite some time, and it began to change in the 1960s, largely because of the rise of advertising, particularly television advertising. In the 1960s is when advertisement as a medium really starts to enter into public consciousness. And so resumes at that point kind of stop being pure biographies and start becoming more like marketing documents. This idea of resume as sales literature starts to sort of creep in, and it becomes less about just strictly saying, here's the jobs that I've held, and you know, these were my specific duties, and becomes more about trying to convince somebody of something. This is also a time when resumes begin to be, uh, have a serious interest from scholars as a, resume, as a writing type and situation. And frankly, this kind of parallels the rise of composition studies in a kind of larger sense, um, and particularly business writing composition studies. The 1980s is the next big epoch and shift, and that's the rise of word processing software. Before really home-based word processing software, it was kind of difficult to think too much about design in a resume. It was about language, it was about formatting, but you couldn't really do anything too fancy. But word processing programs usher in a fixation on resume appearance and formatting. People start thinking a lot about what kind of a font they're going to be using. How many pages should it be? Where should things be? What's the margin? How much white space should I have? All of these concerns start creeping in. And finally, in the 2010s and slightly before, you get the next big thing, which is the rise of search engines and how they spark an obsession with keywords and discoverability. People stop writing, in some cases, resumes to individuals, and they start writing resumes to actual like search engine bots and start trying to populate with keywords and, and get the resume found and talking to an audience sometimes becomes a little secondary. And that can, I think, be a little bit of a flawed way of approaching resumes if that's the dominant thing. We'll talk about that right now. The bottom line though is a lot of confusion with resumes happens because when you learned about resumes has a lot to do with how you think about them and what you value. 
if you were learning about resumes back in the 1980s from people who learned about them, then I get a lot of questions about font, about page, about you know, size, and about color, and all these kind of formatting things. Um, whereas people who maybe taken resume classes in you know, the 1970s, and you know, for people who were learning from the 1960s advertisements, then it becomes resume as sales literature. Younger people often think about it in terms of the technological placement of resumes. I personally, however, go for that kind of 1960s theoretical way of thinking about it, which is probably just about my background. I think that's the most useful lens whenever you're in any of unique resume situation. And so I'll be talking about that uh, well, right now. The most useful way I think about thinking about a resume is thinking about it like it's a conversation. When you're actually talking to somebody, I see a lot of resumes sometimes that kind of over-prioritize one side of the conversation over the other. There's the applicant and the employer, and these two people really need to be exchange, engaging in kind of an implicit dialogue or even really an argument if you think about a resume as a persuasive document where you're trying to communicate why you are the candidate to best satisfy the needs that a job employer is looking for. Now, it's hard to talk if you're only aware of one side of, an, of a conversation. Resumes that are only concerned with the employer's side and that neglect the applicant are usually overly eager to please. And they think about resume writing as a matter of figuring out what people want to hear and then reciting it back to them. These are the resumes that harvest terms and language from job advertisements and then spit it back without consideration or are overly fixated on what particular industries like in a resume. In a more modern context, these are the resumes that populate their lines with you know, keyword regardless of whether they're the best match for the particular objective or situation. Mostly, I think this habit is motivated by a desire to create a resume that shows people what they want to see. This is difficult because one of the only consensuses in scholarship about resumes is that there's very little consensus among employers. Even basic things like whether you should include an objective statement or the dates that you attend college, if we're being honest about things, there's no universal standard about those, those kinds of traits. There are some dominant ones, like almost 80% of human resource managers prefer a straight chronological resume, but only 56% of respondents said they liked the cover letter. And 56% is barely better than a coin flip. So the unfortunate reality here is that you're never fully going to know the preferences of the person who's reading your resume, and focus only on, focusing only on showing them what they want to see is a really challenging exercise. On the other hand, it's equally troublesome to write a resume that overemphasizes the applicant's needs and disregards the employer's. Resumes overemphasizing applicants are sometimes compelled to include every single thing about themselves, giving all parts of the candidacy equal weight. These resumes don't consider things like readability or appearance or user experience, and they don't make any effort at all to identify what kind of features a particular candidate might need. These resumes oversimplify the problem down to how do I want to appear without thinking about who you're appearing to. The best resumes, though, respect both sides of the equation, clearly communicating a point about the suitability for a given position. Now, if the conversation image doesn't, doesn't help you there, um, here's one that I really like, and that's the Venn diagram. Whenever anybody writes a resume, regardless of what your objective actually is, you're going to be striking a balance between the specifics of your work history and the needs of your target job, what you're actually going for and what you try to uh, achieve within a resume. And within those intersections, or within the intersection between those two things, that's where you're going to be getting the actual material for your resume itself. So that's a little bit about kind of resumes and a general way of thinking about them. If you're really coming at this fresh, there's a lot more information about the specific sections of a resume, like the education, work history, technical um, experience, all those kind of things in that resumes uh, on writing on the job hunt course that I've got. But for right now, let's look at some of the specific examples of situations that we harvested from social media. The first resume question, well, I'm sorry, first thing to say is that we're going to go over four questions here that I thought were pretty representative. And we're going to talk about them in three ways. First, looking at the original question, then talking about that question's nuances and implications, 
And then I'm going to kind of propose a new question. You know, sometimes uh, the way the questions were initially framed might not have been the, the most productive framing. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and maybe recalibrate things just a little bit. Resume question number one is a situation that I call the awkward conversation. Every single candidate, I think, has a dimension to their resume that they're not 100% comfortable with and they'd like to avoid if possible. Um, sometimes you just can't avoid those kinds of things. Um, to give you a specific example here, the question that came in was, what if I was fired or let go from my last position? Does listing that job set me up for failure if the person I interview with contacts the company? Now, this is a situation a lot of people are in. Um, there was a recession. A lot of people let go very recently, as I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are, are more practically and immediately aware. And so I think, though, that for me, this is an example of a resume question that seems a little overly concerned with how a candidate will appear to a potential employer, perhaps at the expense of accuracy in their own resume. This is a good question to consider, though, in the light of uh, your own individual things. Um, I do want to make one larger point, though, about your specific circumstances and anything you might want to dodge. And from my point of view, honesty is an absolutely critical element in a resume. Now, I know that may sound self-evident, but you'd be surprised how many people have this kind of cynicism about the process of resume writing. They'll lie about background, conceal unpleasantness, or again, populate resumes with keywords that have nothing to do with their background just for the sake of trying to scale some search engine results. In a recent survey of undergraduates, um, over 50% said they'd feel comfortable lying on a resume if they thought it would get them noticed or get them a foot in the door, which to me is kind of a startling ethical admission. They were talking about adding in keywords to the resume that had nothing to do with their uh, background and for the sake of trying to get a higher search engine results. But I think the larger attitude ports out pretty well. And I've even heard of recruiters who hate resumes entirely on the grounds that everything, everybody lies. And I think this cynicism comes from a variety of sources. Most directly, the belief that employers are going to be unrealistic about candidates that they want and will try to take advantage of applicants. So since everybody lies, it's necessary to get ahead. You know, I've even heard people say things like, everyone else is going to lie on their resume, so I might as well too. Now, I personally think that attitude is pretty toxic. And it might even be a holdover from the resume as marketing document that started in the 60s, that idea, and kind of taken to its you know, cynical conclusion. Now, as for the specifics on this one, uh, we have to do a little bit of speculation since fired can really mean a lot of different things. Um, there's sometimes reasons that people get let go from a position that you know, aren't you know, nefarious or unflattering reasons. If the business is down, downsizing and you know, position gets phased out, so, you know, those can be particularly, you know, there's, there's no reason not to have that conversation if that was the circumstance. Uh, certainly that's no reason to, to leave things off. Um, on the other hand, if fired meant you were fired for embezzlement or you know, violating a non-disclosure agreement or some other kind of ethical you know, uh, malfeasance, then you're in a situation where you might need to do something a little different. Now, with that in mind, I would not volunteer the information about why you were let go, but there's no reason to hide it either. If somebody asks you why you left your last position, you know, be upfront about the circumstances and the narrative. Try not to go out of your way to trash your former employer. That kind of thing almost rarely goes over well. But you know, if somebody does contact the previous employer, then they're going to find out about the truth of the matter anyway. So I'd manage the job description in this case just like you would on a traditional chronological resume. Dates worked, positions held, accomplishments or achievements that you, you managed to fulfill, as well as basic duties. And I think that's really probably the, uh, the best way to handle that kind of situation. There's a way of reframing the question that might be productive. The original question was, what if I was fired or let go from my last position? Does listing that job set me up for failure if the person I interviewed with contacts the company? A better way of thinking about it, or maybe not better, but perhaps a more um, generative and useful way, is does the potential benefit of the position's experience outweigh the potential drawbacks of the awkward conversation? And that's a way of framing this question that can apply not only to being let go from a position, but to an employment gap, to any other thing. 
Um, generally, my advice is not to conceal things, you know, particularly if it's something as large as a job that you've held. So here's resume question number two, different circumstance. This one is the job hopper. I think a lot of people find themselves in these kind of situations. And the question that comes up here is, I took a job for a few months, but then something much better came along. Is it better to leave that experience off and leave a gap in my employment or include it even if it was a short position? My first thought here is that this might not be really an either or kind of question since there's a range of more nuanced ways to manage this situation other than to just you know, leave the job on or take it off. To be left on minimized, left on but contrasted with other positions in terms of their abilities or skill sets, or even included but without any actual description or development. So you just have the position there but not even you know, any bullet points if you really just want to establish that you had the job. Like our first question though, we have to get a little bit speculative here because we really don't know a lot of these specifics. Let's start with the notion of a job. What kind of job are we talking about here? Is it something field appropriate? Is it something that is off of expectations like you, you know, have a degree in computer science and you're working in a, a zoo, like something that's really off field? Or is it something that's fairly still in line? Um, I'm going to assume that it's, it's fairly in line with the applicant's overall professional identity here. The next big question is this idea of much better. That can mean a lot of things. Better in the sense that there's a field appropriate option now. Um, is there a toxic work environment? Do you have a new job that's closer to home? Did the new job you have represent a promotion? Was it simply more money? You know, what does much better mean in this case? I'm sure the applicant is concerned about appearing unreliable, but you know, how you handle this circumstance depends kind of on what answer you would give to why you need it to be better. And then there's this moment of gap. How long of a gap are we talking about? Is it just a, a couple of months that would be on there? Um, is it far back in the employment, even though, you know, if it was, is it pretty far back in the employment? I guess we really don't know if this was the most recent job someone had or, or what exactly. But in most resumes, regarding the question of keeping it off the job, some employment is going to be looked at as better than no employment. So I'd say if the jo short job is out of your chosen field, or perhaps you know, something that's really far back in the past, you can omit it, but minimize the gap. Uh, the easiest way to do that would be to have a situation where if you only had a job for a couple of months, when you put down what job you had for the dates work there, just put years. You can sometimes you know, make it a situation where you don't have that gap draw too much attention to itself. You're obviously not going to deny it if you know, somebody asks you about it, but it can you know, keep or somebody's attention focus on the more strategic parts of the resume. On the other hand, if the short job shows growth or experience in the relevant field, leave it on, include the dates, but be prepared to explain your quick departure. So a different way of framing this first question, no, the second question, I'm sorry. I took a job for a few months and something better came along. Is it better to leave that experience off? Another way of thinking about this question is, what are the advantages of listing the position and to what extent can I defend and explain my reasons for leaving that position quickly to a reasonable third party? Okay, two down and two to go. Let's talk about the third question that I got that I thought that was useful. This is a question of an unrelated degree. Somebody on Twitter sent in a question that was, I have a college degree, but it in no way aligns to my work history or the position that I'm after. How much does that count? Well, my first response here is that phrasing how much does that count indicates somebody that might be a little overly concerned with what people will think about his or her resume to the point where it might be a little bit paralyzing. It's also a tough way to frame the question for reasons we'll talk about in just a moment. The bottom line is that this is not an uncommon situation though, and I know lots of people, myself included, who are doing the kinds of work they would have never expected themselves to be doing back when they were in school. In technology especially, this is because the circumstances of the field change so rapidly in terms of both hardware and methodology. For example, I finished graduate school almost a decade ago, and when I got my degree, the kind of work I'm doing now, and I mean, I'm literally right now in this immediate moment, did not exist. 
there was minimal streaming video. Webinars were not yet a common thing. Now, a big chunk of my professional identity is built around streaming content. So having an unrelated degree doesn't necessarily disqualify you outright, especially if the work history aligns to the target position. The best news about this particular question is that phrase, the position that I am after. So it shows that the writer really does seem to have a concrete goal. As for how much that counts, the value of education really depends on the context. If it's not an asset, it can be made, again, less prominent, but it should really still be included. If you've got an undergraduate degree and it shows how you spent a minimum four years of your life, that's worth in putting in, um, especially since from the point of view of a lot of applicants, having an undergraduate degree mostly indicates I have the ability to learn. I read an article once about goals of, of college, and the, <laughs> the kind of playful synthesis that I really liked is that getting an undergraduate degree is about demonstrating that you're becoming someone who can be trusted not to screw something up. Now, it shows that you're responsible, shows that you have the ability to follow through with tasks, learn what you need to learn, apply that knowledge, and those are kind of transferable skills that could be useful regardless of you know, what the degree actually is. For that matter, if an unrelated degree might be an asset, depending on the specific job you're going for. Like if you've got a you know, degree in biology, for example, and you're applying for a tech job at a hospital you know, where you can show you understand a little bit about the medical side of things, even if that's not your particular field. So if appropriate, and you really have a job that is totally off base, you can show equivalent work or certification experience. You know, you've got your certs for the technology. You've got a lot of work that puts in that is appropriate, which I think based on the original question here is the kind of situation we're talking about. You can make sure and demonstrate that on the resume. And finally, how much education counts kind of depends on the position being targeted. If someone specifies you must have a degree in this field and you don't, it probably counts for quite a lot. You know, they wouldn't say this is what we want unless they actually did want it. So to reframe the question, the original question, I have a college degree but it in no way aligns to work history, might be revised as, can I demonstrate equivalent experience to compensate for the unrelated degree, or does it realistically disqualify me from the target position? And our final question before we go into live conversation for the last you know, 15 minutes or so, has to do with what I call the pinball candidate. Now, the pinball candidate comes from an image that I really like back from you know, old arcade days. And that's someone who just goes bing, 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 bouncing around to lots of different things. This is different from the job hopper candidate because of the scope of experience. I love this question that came in. My work history makes me look like a crazy person. I've worked in so many different fields. Does this help or hurt my prospects? Now, the big question here has to do with what the prospects actually are. In some cases, a diverse background is going to be useful and it can really be highlighted. But if you're looking for something where you've got a job that specifies a certain number of years of experience, you're going to make sure you fulfill that uh, criteria. As for how to handle this, I would think back to this intersection between work history and target job. It's entirely possible that there are things within the work history that might not be directly relevant, but there's soft skills, management experience, writing experience, problem solving abilities, working in groups that are nice transferable elements, but they don't have to do with kind of the hard skill classifications. So the first thing I would recommend doing is really thinking back on those past experiences and figuring out what can I leverage that shows transferable skill sets that are going to help me achieve the job that I, I want. This is also one of those circumstances where it's useful to remember that a resume is not a biography. You don't have to include everything in your background. If there's stuff in the background from diverse jobs that really doesn't apply, you can marginalize that. You also don't have to include everything from your background if you have a lot of different kind of fields that you've touched on within the same proportions. That element of a resume has to list every single thing that you've ever done notion uh, is harkens back to the resume as a fact-based objective document 
rather than a persuasive one that started back in the 1920s. So what I recommend is try to create a coherent personal narrative for yourself showing how you've built to the job that you want by emphasizing which parts of your background best link to the target job. And this is also the circumstance where it might be useful to consider creating a functional resume. A functional resume is a resume that is designed around skill sets as opposed to being designed around a chronological history of a job. Functional resumes are good for candidates with truly unconventional backgrounds, like people with a five-year work gap, for example. Like, I've got a twin sister, and my mom stayed home for five years to, to take care of us when, when we were young. Um, or if you're transitioning out of military experience to civilian life, or if you're really switching careers in a highly dramatic way, which is what I've already alluded to. And there's a lot more detail about functional resumes, how they operate, and how to design them that is located in the online resume content for Pluralsight. So how to reframe question four in a way that is going to be useful and practical. The original question was, my work history makes me look like a crazy person. I've worked in so many different fields. Does this help or hurt my prospects? Revised question, how can I best leverage the relevant experiences from my diverse background and show that they have meaningfully prepared me for my current objective? And if you're looking for kind of any resume framing technique that's going to be useful to you as a way of thinking about a resume, not necessarily as like populating the existing resume with your own information, that how can I best leverage the relevant experiences is a really good nugget takeaway from this webinar, as is that conversation or Venn diagram image that we talked about a little bit earlier. So that's what we've got in terms of prepared content. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left for our scheduled resume, and we got a bit of a late start, so I'm comfortable going a little bit beyond um, noon if people are, are there and still have questions. But we're going to exit my screen sharing mode and drop right back into the uh, conference interface to see what you guys have to, have to ask. This is the part where I've been the most uh, kind of curious what's going to happen. Uh, Lindsay, you still there? All right, still no here. response. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing right, right now. Uh, okay. okay, let me scan through here, and I've got a couple of questions that you've promoted up, so it'll be right in front of me. Um, we've got, how do I leverage my current job and skills to help me change my career to another field? And that comes from Les uh, Quale, I believe. Now, we talked about this kind of in a, a general way when we were looking at the, um, the slides. The real trick involves identifying moments where you're going to be able to apply previous things with your, um, to your new job objective. Um, so if Les is actually still online here, uh, what specific pre new field are you looking to go into? Um, if you respond to, you know, via chat, we'll see if that comes up. In the meantime, I'll go with a, another question that I see here. What would you recommend for someone who's been in the workforce for a couple of decades do in their resume to avoid age discrimination? And this is a, uh, a very difficult question to answer. I'm, I believe wholeheartedly that it exists, and you know, I'm sure that, that people have um, encountered circumstances where you look at the length of job history and, and think I'm going to go with a younger candidate that's a cheaper candidate or you know, some other kind of practical lines. Um, my first response to that is if someone is really going to be operating with that kind of ethical framework, um, it's, it's probably best that you're not going to be involved with them as a, as a company. Um, as far as what you can do, there's, there's not a whole lot outside of really being selective with what you choose to include. Maybe you only go back to your most recent uh, positions, or maybe you, you know, don't go all the way back in or, or leave a couple of, of dates off um, if you think that it's going to make a, a more persuasive candidate. But the really good opportunity here is leveraging something that you're afraid is being perceived as a weakness and try to frame it as a strength scope of experience, ability to work with people, the breadth of 
criteria and um, material that you can bring to a situation. Those are the kind of things that younger candidates, while they may be cheaper and a little bit flashier at times, that they can't really bring into those kind of, of circumstances. So try to take advantage of that and look and make sure you're applying for positions that are a good match for the extensive material that you've got. Um, scanning through other things. Hi, Alan. I've been on sabbatical for a year and a half working on personal projects with a new tech stack. Developer with nine plus years of .NET switching to Apple stack. Should I return to the job search? Is there a good way to target both tech stacks without having two separate CVs? What strategy would you advise? Well, my first response to that is I don't think there's a problem with having two separate resumes. Back when I was applying for jobs, um, when I first you know, finished up undergraduate, I was applying for jobs in a whole variety of fields. Uh, some of them were in publishing. Some of them were in technical writing. Some of them were in more creative writing, like creative nonfiction magazine kind of pieces. And I actually had four or five resumes that I was circulating. Now, I, I personally recommend and, and talk about this in my course a little bit, that you go through and customize a resume for every individual job that you're targeting. As for how to handle it if you're not targeting a specific job, like you're going through and you know, putting something up onto a search database where people can go and, and kind of find you, in that case, it might be a question of, of deciding what kind of job you're specifically looking for. Are you looking for something that can you know, allow you to straddle both kinds of, of technologies or something that is going to allow you to you know, really aim for a specialty and, and try to achieve it and keep it. But as far as my ways of, of thinking about it, I, I don't see a problem with creating multiple resumes, particularly if you're going to be applying for an individual job that has its own set of expectations and needs that are already articulated. Then I've got, I just finished traveling for a year and looking for a job. Should I put my soft skills from traveling on my resume? i.e. organizing the whole trip, budgeting, etc. This, to me, kind of depends a little bit on what else is in the, the, the resume portfolio. Namely, if you're a younger candidate and you've just decided to go through and, and do a little bit of traveling on your own before entering the workforce full time, then I think it could be an advantage if only to show you weren't just unemployed and, and not doing anything for that whole time. Um, I've got a couple of friends who have chosen to do this kind of thing. Like one friend of mine was uh, an editor of a publication that I worked with in undergraduate. And after she graduated, she took six months to, and, and hiked the Appalachian Trail all the way up from Georgia to, to Maine, I believe. And that took a long time, but her argument was there's never going to be another opportunity in my life that I have to do something like this, so I'm going to do it. And in that moment, she was basically living out of a tent and you know, eating what she took with her. When she created her resume, she did include that and said, this is what I was doing, and kind of did exactly what you were describing. If, for example, you're an older candidate, though, and, and that's a little bit farther in the back, um, which actually now that I look at the question again is not in, in the circumstances because it says I've just finished traveling for a year and looking for the job. Um, I think it's, it's probably not going to hurt necessarily, but if you're, you've got a lot of other material on a resume that can demonstrate your candidacy, it's the kind of thing that might be worth leaving off. Um, let me see if anyone else has chimed in with more details. Maybe not at the moment. Um, I feel like I'm pinballing myself here. I've got another question. How true is it that for each position you're applying to, you need to apply and modify your resume to match the position needs? I, I'd say it's very true. You know, and one of my big pieces of advice in you know, writing that I do on this subject and courses that I teach is that I think it's, it's not only recommended, it's, it's critical. If someone took the time to look at a, a job advertisement and craft it and think about what they're looking for, then it's in your best interest to demonstrate that you've taken the time to, to read it. Quick personal story in that regard. I knew somebody once who was looking for a technical 
office manager, somebody who's just going to be in charge of maintaining network uptime and you know, those kind of generalist office things. And he posted a job advertisement that named his company, and he got about I think 250 applicants for that position. And he said of those 250 applicants, only two showed any awareness in their application materials of who he was, like what his company did, what they were into, and you know, that referenced that in the cover letter even at all. So two out of 250 is, is a less than 1% ratio of people who took that initiative. And he said those two people, based on the strength of that, immediately got moved on from the resume to the interview phase based on the logic of if they're willing to take the time to figure out who I am and talk to me as an individual, I'm willing to take the time to figure out who they are. And I think that that is, even though it's anecdotal, you know, really bears out. So, so that's one of the things I would have to say to, to you, Carlos. Um, let's see what we've got here. A uh, follow-up from our previous question of the person who spent a year traveling and looking for a job. As a new graduate, would you recommend graduates include everything in resume, the clubs, projects, related courses, unrelated work experience? Would it still be preferable to keep the resume on one page, or are we okay to have two pages long to list all of the experiences? I think that if you're a really recent graduate, there's very little reason to have a resume that stretches out into two pages. Um, you're going to have to be selective about the material that you include in a circumstance like that. Um, the exception to this is if you've got a lot of really strong technical experience and it just takes time to list all of your you know, coding languages and programs that you know pretty well. That kind of stuff can chew up space on a resume and push it on to six pages sometimes. Or I'm sorry, push it on to, to more than two pages sometimes. But uh, if you're new, I think that a one-page resume is what I would recommend. So I'm going to go back to my, my kind of Venn diagram image. Look at your own background and ask really honestly what parts of the background show the clearest intersection with what a app employer is really going to want to be looking for. Um, then we have another one here. Hi, I will start my second academic year this September. My question is, is volunteering experience or having more skills will help me get an internship? Well, if you're going for an internship, um, you're, one of the reasons people get unpaid internships is because they're a little shy on work experience most of the time. Yeah, that's, that's part of the goal of the internship. So I think that you really in that case can go through and talk more about your academic qualifications or a little bit of the club or affiliation kind of things you've done that I was encouraging the previous candidate to, to kind of marginalize sometimes. Because um, one of the, the other big images here, you know, your job objective is going to be a huge function for how you, you kind of choose what to, to put. So if you're still in school, you know, there's nothing wrong with referencing things that you do when you're still in school because oftentimes internships are looking for things like how many courses someone has fulfilled, um, what kinds of professional aptitudes they've been able to develop, you know, what kind of special projects that they've been involved with, and talk a little bit about this. There's actually a module in my um, resumes research and writing on the job hunt course that talks specifically about resumes for the recent graduate and the kind of things that you can, can reference. So I would direct you to, to those here. Something here from Carlos. When developing the resume, how needed is it that on the first lines you add your elevator pitch? The elevator pitch, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, is a concept that when you're trying to you know, communicate what you've, what you've got or who you are, you should be able to answer the question in the amount of time it takes to go from the third floor of, on an elevator down to the first floor. Um, and I would say that people need to have kind of a succinct objective for what kind of job they're, they're going for. Um, when I, I referenced earlier kind of the fragmentation of, job obje of, of what people are looking for and prefer in a resume, about you know, 
60% of people, respondents, said they like the job objective statement. I personally like it because it's a clear declaration of identity, and it also can provide a very useful lens to, to frame uh, for framing the rest of the, the resume. As for how critical it is, um, I don't know that it's necessarily critical, but I, I tend to think that it's, it's a pretty useful element. Uh, okay. I see something here from the chairperson. Alan, any advice for simply, and by chairperson I mean Lindsay, <laughs> any advice for simply getting your resume in the hands of the right hiring manager? We hear a lot of people find their carefully crafted resumes just end up in a pile or lost in someone's inbox. If you're simply paying the percentages, that's the way that it's usually going to go. Um, I think the average job gets between 400 and 500 applicants that are like direct applicants, and so it's really hard to, to kind of stand out. Um, back in 2009, the Wall Street Journal ran an article that talked about kind of gimmicky things people were trying to do to stand out, and it was stuff like mailing somebody a shoebox and you know, that had your resume inside and say, I'm just trying to get a foot in the door, like those kind of things. And you know, maybe that are good for a chuckle, but usually fall pretty flat in terms of describing the actual candidacy. So there's a couple of things that are recommended. Um, I talked a little bit about keywords, and those are the kind of things that people are going to be most likely to type in if you are you know, they're looking for a job of somebody who has a particular candidate or a particular set of qualifications. Generally, when you're using keywords, having the keywords uh, associated with the top of the resume can you know, help improve search engine results a little bit. Variation of terms, like uh, if you're a coder, for example, you know, having coder, coding, coded, kind of variations of that you know, might increase keyword density just a little bit. Uh, you can really, I think, have the greatest likelihood just by talking to people like they're individuals. Like if you're applying for a job, you make sure you're applying for that job. You, know, you may be applying for you know, 50 different resumes, but I, I, I personally think that people have a higher return on investment applying to 10 jobs with precision than applying to 100 jobs with kind of a carpet bombing technique. As far as other things that uh, you can do, um, that's, that's really the main thing that I have to say. I think that most, a lot of resumes end up getting tossed from the pile because they don't meet the you know, basic requirements in terms of education or level of experience or proficiencies, uh, or they're just not communicating their objective and identity clearly. The average person on the first pass on a resume spends about seven seconds looking at it. So in those seven seconds, it has to be inescapably clear what your identity is as a candidate and what main deliverable you can provide to a company. And I talk a lot about, again, in the, uh, the first module of the, the course that's in our plural set library covers this, and, and we spend like 20 minutes just on this topic. Uh, let me see here. We're bumping up against 12 o'clock. Lindsay, do we have time for, for one more? If there's a good one back here. We probably have time for one more question. Do you want to take a look and pick your favorite question? And, uh, yeah, I'm um, scrolling up here. Um, see if there's any good ones. Okay. I work for this. Okay, um, we've got one here says, I work with over 100 students every 12 weeks that are graduating from our coding boot camp. They are new to the industry and are junior level developers, but every company wants to hire coders with three to five years of experience. How do I help them create a resume that stands out? Well, I, in terms of a resume that stands out, if you're kind of don't have the level of experience, um, you've got 12 weeks versus three years. I think that the first thing that people should be doing is spending as much time getting the experience that they, that they need. Um, but the thing that can help stand out if you don't have 
a lot of experience is being really, really precise about the kinds of experience that you do have. Um, if you're from a coding boot camp, what kind of projects what, that did you work on? What kind of deliverables did you create? What range of languages was worked with? Um, if you can't stand out in terms of scope, what you have to do to stand out is try to stand out in terms of precision and detail. So you can hopefully illustrate that the experience you do have is particularly intensive. And that might not be able to help you with a full-time job, like if you're looking for three to five years of experience, but it would be useful to try to develop uh, more contract work, more volunteer work, more freelance work if you can start coding personal applications just to kind of increase the range of experience that they've got. But in the short term, uh, you've got to play with your strengths. If you don't have the experience in terms of length, talk about it in terms of its depth and its you know, deliverable qualities. And I think that answered the question. Okay. Um, Lindsay, do you want to, to wrap it up here? Um, that's, that's what I've got to say. Yes, I think that's all the time we have today. Alan, um, did you have any closing remarks in addition to that? Yeah, closing remarks, I, I guess, is just to illustrate um, the limit. I, I really enjoyed, first of all, the interactivity here and, and getting to answer some of the questions that people had. Um, hopefully that's going to enhance the kind of core resume technique that we articulate and, and go through in the Pluralsight library. Uh, if you still have questions, there's a lot of material that's available there. Um, my course is the Resumes, Research, and Writing, and the Job Hunt course. There's also a variety of blogs available uh, within the, the Pluralsight blog. Um, and we've got a couple of other resume courses coming down the pipeline as well as a uh, white paper that's going to be available for download um, on Pluralsight.com that's going to focus in on kind of recent changes in scholarship and resumes in the last five years or so and how people might have to you know, keep up with the times and make sure they're writing a resume that is a 2010 resume as opposed to drawing from methodology a little bit farther back in the timeline that we looked at here. Other than that, thank you very much for you know, tuning in, and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, please continue the conversation on Twitter. Um, tag your question with hashtag PluralSiteLive. We'll make sure uh, to share your questions with Alan later. Um, and again, we will be picking a winner for a free month of training with Pluralsight as long as you tag your question with Pluralsight Live. Um, if you have any questions about our webinars or any suggestions or comments, please share that with us at webinars at Pluralsight.com. We did record this session. We will share the recording with you uh, next week. As soon as we have that posted, we'll email it out. Um, and with that, thank you for joining us. Please take our survey when you leave. Uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.